recording started. Thank you for joining us for this session of the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. The K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series is designed to help K-12 educators reimagine education with Blackboard teaching and learning solutions. The K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series harnesses the power of our K-12 community of academic leaders, teachers, and other experts to provide relevant, real-time, on-demand, and ongoing professional development opportunities for K-12 educators. My name is Katie Gallagher and I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager for Blackboard's Teaching and Learning Solutions and Products and will be serving as the moderator for the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. Um, Jenny Breister, our Senior Marketing Manager from our Field Marketing Team is joining us today and she'll also be hosting the Spring Series. A thank you to Jenny for um, her help today. We'll be joining you this spring, and we're always open to new ideas uh, for topics for the series. So please let us know if you're interested in presenting a future session. Each webinar in the series is recorded. You can search for the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series on the Blackboard TV YouTube channel or go to tinyurl.com slash k 12 You'll be receiving the recording and the presentation slides from this session in a few days by email, and you'll also receive an invitation to participate in an online professional learning community designed to augment this series and create an avenue for ongoing collaboration and dialogue. So be sure to accept the invitation and participate in the new online PLC. As you can see, we have many exciting professional development sessions lined up this spring, so don't forget to join us on Monday. Uh, for a teacher toolbox reshaping assessment and feedback for online students with Jenny Davis from the North Carolina Virtual School. Go to bbbb.blackboard.com slash k12bits to register for Monday session or any session within the series. If you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Blackboard K-12 Live app for more professional development on demand. All the sessions from this series are added to the app as we go. Um, and you'll also get to experience the best from Blackboard World last summer. Today we're very pleased to have Claudine Townley joining us. She'll take us through breaking through the bricks, providing student feedback in an online environment. How is providing feedback in an online environment different from in a brick and mortar classroom? Explore key considerations and best practices in providing specific and engaging feedback to learners of all ages in a digital classroom in order to improve student success. Claudine is a K-12 Blackboard Solutions Engineer with a focus on teaching and learning and adoption success. She has spent over 20 years in public education in both the brick and mortar and online worlds. Her former roles included language arts teacher, reading coach, and director of Florida Virtual Schools Global Department. She's also a published author, a national board certified teacher, and holds a Master's of Science in Education with a specialization in reading and literacy. So welcome to Claudine. We're so happy to have her here today. And, and before I completely hand it off to her, just a little housekeeping. Um, we'd like to keep the sessions as interactive as possible. Please use the chat. Um, and also don't hesitate to use your talk button to ask a question. Either one is fine. We'll watch the chat. And um, you know, we welcome questions through, through the talk button. If you're not asking a question, though, we do ask you to be sure your talk button is not selected so we can ensure high quality recording. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Claudine. We're excited for your session. Thanks so much, Katie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, a quick housekeeping item from me. I want to make sure that you're all able to hear me okay. So if you could give me a smiley face or a green check from up there on the top. Thank you so much. Awesome. So I am going to ask you to interact today. So please um, feel free to use the chat to ask questions. As um, Katie mentioned, um, the more interactive we are, the, the more fun this will be. I don't really need to go over this slide since Katie gave me such a very nice um, introduction. I just do want to let you know that I am a former educator and always consider myself to be an educator um, at heart. Um, my passions really include providing as many different opportunities for students to be successful throughout their schooling, um, regardless of where they are. Um, as the mom of two teenagers, I can definitely vouch for um, being able to have lots of different opportunities for students is really what makes them successful. 
Today we're, we're going to focus on differences in student feedback um, when you provide it in a brick and mortar environment um, compared to when you provide it online. We're going to start by identifying some of those key differences and then explore ideas such as resubmissions, mastery learning, um, thinking about student learning styles, and really look at what makes student feedback specific, personal, engaging, timely, and all those things we want to do for our students to make sure that we are improving their ability to learn, because that's really what we are all here for. So let's think about this. Certainly there are differences between providing feedback in a brick and mortar versus an online environment, or we wouldn't be having this session today. If you, it's just like the turtle and the tortoise. If you think about those differences, if you've taught um, in an online environment before, whether it's blended or completely virtual, you may have noticed some of those differences. In the chat box, can you provide me um, with some of the differences that you can think of um, between providing feedback online, think about an LMS, um, versus when you're in a brick and mortar classroom? Can anybody think of anything? I'm going to pause and provide uncomfortable silence for you while you think. Making it personal, absolutely. Because it, when we're in the brick and mortar setting, we see our students, we can, we can look at them, we can make it personal, we can hand back um, papers to students and actually um, give them feedback, verbal feedback. Again, having those live people on the other end makes it different. Really want to make it relevant to them and to their lives, that's awesome. Um, Judy, that's a really good point. It's hard to see personal reactions um, because you don't know what people are seeing, so you have to change your feedback. Thinking about that and thinking about that student on the other line and knowing that you might not know um, exactly what their reaction is, so really being as specific as possible, thinking about the emotion, tone, Lisa, absolutely, it's, we're going to actually talk about that, is absolutely crucial. We know that even if you, I'm sure you've been on the other end of a text or an email that, or maybe you sent one where the tone wasn't exactly as you intended. Um, maybe you were being sarcastic and you thought you were being funny and someone else took it as um, not so much and thought you were being completely serious. So we have to really be careful of that in our students when we're offering feedback to our students in the online environment. Thank you so much for your participation there. So some of the key considerations that we want to think about when we provide that feedback in the online setting are some of the things that you actually brought up. So we want to be student-centered. We want to personalize. We want to think about tone and voice. We're going to talk about something called the sandwich approach. We're going to think about moderation and specificity and think about things like learning style and reading ability. A few other items that we might not think about um, in the online world are things like turnaround time and submissions and even time management of for, the, for yourself, for teachers. So let's take a look at each one of these in turn. The first one is to be student-centered. And to me, if you focus on this one, you'll probably get everything else right. And also, I, I really believe that this, it doesn't matter if you are in the completely brick and mortar, if you're blended, or if you're completely virtual, we always want to be student-centered. We want to think about that particular student. We want to personalize the feedback as much as we can and, and, and really give feedback that's specific to that student so that we can engage them. So be student-centered, thinking about why we're here and those students and what is going to make them su successful. One of the ways we can do that is by personalizing feedback. And what do I mean by personalizing? Well, sometimes um, when students turn, turn in an assignment and you might be typing your feedback in maybe a learning management system, you're providing feedback to them, you may just say something um, like, good job. But we really want to be more personal than that. We want to use greetings. We want to use closing, so hello and goodbye, and sincerely, and thank you. We want to use the student's name whenever possible. We all love to hear the sound of our own name. And we want the student to know that this isn't just canned feedback. This is something that we've written specifically for that person. We also want to think about that student in question, kind of like what we just talked about. So if you're providing student uh, feedback to Johnny, and Johnny really loves baseball, is there any way that you can bring in what you know about Johnny? You probably can't do it every time, 
but think about that particular student and how you're going to engage them. And then you always want to sign your name. You want the student to know that you are, you are a real person on the other line, on the other side of that feedback, so that they understand and that they feel comfortable reaching out to you. If we're looking at Blackboard Learn, you can see what that kind of feedback might look like. So here we have um, some feedback to Janet, and you can see that we use a, a greeting, dear, and we use Janet's name. Um, we're encouraging. We have a closing. We sign our name. We want to just be as personal as we can be. Another really crucial element that some of you already brought up is tone and voice. Um, when you are offering feedback online, just like when you're writing an email or sending a text or anything that you're doing online, when you can't see the person's face on the other side, you have to remember that your voice is going to come across differently, or it may come across differently than it does in person. We really want to be careful to choose our words carefully so that they aren't misconstrued, thinking about your tone, also thinking about things like proper netiquette. You want to um, be positive, always be positive. Think about um, perhaps the time that you receive feedback from uh, a teacher. Maybe it was in college. And it could have even been um, a physical piece of paper. Sometimes that tone, that an attitude that comes across could be negative. And when you get something back with that kind of tone where it feels negative, it doesn't really make you want to engage in that class with that teacher, um, even it, with that assignment anymore. So we want to be as positive as possible. And sometimes I know that's difficult, having been a teacher for a long time. Um, sometimes students don't make that easy. But we really want to be p as positive as we can be. So think about some of these, some of these appropriate responses versus the inappropriate. Um, even something as simple as try again, can we say, I've reset this assignment so you can try again, um, or just resubmit. Is there something else we can say instead of just resubmit? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to a student. And a student is a kid. They're, they're not um, as mature sometimes as we think they are. They may not know what they've done wrong. So we want to think about our tone. We want to, um, if someone said to us, what were you thinking, or you didn't even try to do this correctly, we probably would feel like they've taken an attitude with us. So we want to make sure that we don't do that. Um, we don't know if they did try to do it correctly. So we want, again, to be positive. Think about appropriateness. Think about lengthening your responses a little bit um, so that they seem um, nicer and more pleasant uh, for our students. We're much more likely to get the kind of response we want if we treat them um, just really that golden rule as though we would want to be treated. And then another word about netiquette, to keep in mind that we want to always use proper grammar and punctuation. And I know this seems um, probably very elementary, but you may have seen, um, come across folks that, that maybe don't think this way. We want to make sure we don't use all caps to emphasize a point, and we know that comes across as yelling. Um, I am very guilty sometimes of using, uh, overusing exclamation points. We, again, we want to address the reader. We want to make sure that they know that we're thinking of them personally. Um, if we were in the classroom, we would look at the student. We wouldn't yell at them. We would talk properly. And we would acknowledge if they turned something in. So we want to do the same thing in the digital environment. We want to carry over that same kind of netiquette, that same kind of, um, those same kinds of social skills that we use when we're in the physical classroom. Feedback might look like this. Um, you, here's some journaling feedback. Sometimes just acknowledging to the student that you got what they turned in, and especially if the first time they didn't do it correctly. They may not know whether or not you received it. So you want to make sure that you acknowledge submissions, even if it, you haven't um, got a chance to grade it yet. And the same thing could be true for emails when we're offering feedback in that way. The student emails us and we're working on getting a response. We may just want to say, thanks for your question. I'm working on I'm getting a response for you. Any questions or comments or thoughts so far? OK, great. Another, um, I guess, uh, 
the word I'm looking for, approach, uh, maybe a um, strategy to use is something that we call the sandwich approach. And you may have used this before. Does anyone know what the sandwich approach is? I see a couple folks typing in the chat. Please the negative in between two positives. Good information, correct information, good information, good, bad, good. Yep, you guys got it. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. So let me go back here for just a minute. So you start here with our bread, and we, we want that um, positive layer. So if we give an example, um, in the green is our positive. So we acknowledge um, something good. And sometimes that's hard, and I hate to say that, but sometimes a student um, really is struggling and it, their paper or their, their assignment may be a complete disaster. You may just want to even acknowledge that they tried. Thank you so much for submitting this work or for, try, for giving this your best effort or something that is positive. Because when you walk into a situation and someone comes at you with everything you did wrong, um, it's just, it's, it just doesn't leave you with any sort of good feeling, but we do that a lot to our kids. So we want to start out with something positive and then offer that corrective um, or bad, as you said, Roger, that, you know, what did you do wrong and what could you fix? And then again, finish with something positive. Giving them um, some encouragement is a great way to end. I know that you can do this. I'm confident you can do it. Um, do you, if you need any help, I'm here for you. So making sure that you, you give them confidence. A lot of times, especially when students are doing really poorly, um, they've never had good experiences and they probably have always struggled in that, maybe with, with that subject area. So giving them some confidence a lot of times may be all that they need and perhaps they've never had that before. Letting them know that someone believes in them can really make a key difference. So we really want to think about that sandwich. and. And the other thing we want to think of when we think of that sandwich um, is moderation. So we want the small sandwich, not the big sandwich. So what do I mean by that? When we are offering feedback, sometimes, especially, um, and because I was a high school teacher, I can say this, the subject area teachers can get a little bit, um, I'm going to say not bogged down, but excited about the details. And we want to correct everything that is wrong with a student's work. We want to um, mark just everything that's incorrect. If you think about um, an English paper, perhaps, and I was an English teacher, and I have been guilty of this, um, that comes back completely covered in red ink. That doesn't give you the feeling that you want to try again. It makes you feel like everything that you did was wrong. So we want to really think about moderation. We don't want to overwhelm our students with all of the things that they did incorrectly. Think about what's most important for their understanding. What Most of our students are not going to, if we're an English teacher, maybe they're not going to be, um, most of them probably aren't going to be professional writers, or maybe they're not going to be scientists. So thinking about what are the key things we want them to take away? The students who have natural interests will probably already be doing well. We want to think about what's most important for understanding and think in steps. So what's one thing that you could tell them to fix? And if they fix that, they turn it in again, then you can provide them with one or two other things to fix. So giving them a couple of things is your best bet really not giving them a whole bunch of things that they're probably never going to get to. You have to curtail that instinct to correct everything at once and really think about, again, what is most important for the students to take away. If they could fix one or two things, um, what are those objectives that are really key in your mind? Has anyone been guilty of, of this, of giving too much feedback? You, and it takes a long, it actually takes a very long time to give a lot of bad feedback. Um, that's the paper that you keep pushing to the bottom of the pile when you're doing your grading because you know you, the student needs a lot of help. But again, maybe just picking a couple of things. Can everybody, can anyone give me a smiley face if they've been guilty of giving too much feedback? Yeah, I know I have.
Another thing that's really important when we are thinking about um, giving feedback in the online environment is specificity. Because we don't have that student in front of us, and a lot of times students who may be taking a course, especially if they're 100% online, might be a little bit nervous in the beginning or even throughout the course to reach out to their teacher and ask questions. Some students are scared to ask questions even in um, the face-to-face -face environment. So we want to think about when we get, we're giving our feedback, how can we be as specific as possible? Um, like this sign, um, it's not just that you're going to be fine, but you're going to be fine for $541. That's very specific information. When you're in an online environment, even if you're using um, a blended environment and your students are maybe um, looking at some online content from their home or from another classroom and they've turned in an assignment and you're giving them feedback, if they're not there with you to explain yourself, especially right when that student needs you, um, they may not know what to do. So your feedback should be as specific as possible. You want to include, of course, in moderation, what they've done incorrectly, what they can fix, and what you would like them to change. The other thing that's really important to be specific about is what they've done well. So thinking about the things that you want them to repeat. So that's some of that sandwich approach. What can I put in the beginning that's good? Um, that I want them to continue that behavior. Sometimes students just do things well and they don't know that that's something, it might even be an accident. It might be, they may not know it's something that you would like them to repeat. So you want to call out those things that they've done well and, and encourage them to continue to work in that vein. But also think of, about specifically what you want them to fix and where can they get the help that they need. Is it a phone call to you? Is there an area of the course that they can go to? Is there help documents? Is there a wiki or a help session or even a session, an online asynchronous session that weren't like we're in right now that they could go to to get help? Also including the why behind your suggestions is helpful because when someone's asking you to do something again or to fix something, a lot of times you want to know why. Students may not, if they're like my son, for example, he doesn't always care um, he doesn't want to fix his work, but if the teacher told him why he should fix it, he may be more likely uh, to work on it. What might this look like um, when we're offering feedback online? Um, in Blackboard Learn, it might look like this. So I've used the greeting again, I've used the student's name, and um, I gave them the sandwich approach. You did a fine job about answering the question and explaining your position. So I've given him something positive that I want him to repeat. Specifically, I told him that he referred to information found in the background movie in the documents. And then I've given him some specific things that I want him to focus on, where I want him to look. Um, and I've encouraged him again in the end and used my name and a, and a greeting, or excuse me, a closing. One of my favorite things to think about, actually, is learning styles. And students love to learn, actually, almost all people love to learn about themselves. That's why you see about a million different um, little surveys and quizzes on social media, like Facebook. Um, you know, what would be, um, you know, what color are you, or all of those different surveys, because we like to learn about ourselves. And students like to learn about themselves, too. The more we know about our students, especially when we are not face-to-face -face with them all the time, the better we can help them and the better feedback we can give them if we know their specific learning style. So we certainly have visual, auditory, and you all know the three different learning styles, the major ones. Um, up here there's a bit.ly, uh, shortened um, little website if you want to check it out. Um, there's a great quiz here and some more explanations that are specific to the different kinds of learning styles. So if we, if we have students take a learning styles quiz and, and we have them share that information back with us, then when, when, they, pro, then when they provide, um, when they turn in their work and we're providing feedback, we can think about that learning style and perhaps be um, cognizant and more specific. So if I know a student is auditory, then maybe I'm going to provide feedback uh, with my voice. Um, I had this experience when I first started teaching online. Uh, I was working on my master's in reading, and I had to do a project at the very end, a practicum, and 
part of that project, I had all of my students fill out, uh, take a learning styles quiz. And for extra credit, I had them turn into me their learning style. And a lot of the students um, did it. They, they gave me that information. And what I found was that I was providing feedback largely as I would like to have it myself. So I'm a very visual learner. So I like to read. Um, I like to see the feedback. I don't, I'm not strong auditory at all. I do not like to be read to. I don't like to, to sit and listen to lectures. I, I tend to go away and tune out. I really need something to see. Or uh, my second strength is something to do. So if I'm listening, I also need to maybe write or pace or do something else. So because I was so visual, I would... I was giving students a lot of visual feedback. I was writing a lot. And I would have students who just didn't respond to my feedback. And I would ask them again and again to please return to resubmit their work. Um, and they just didn't respond at all. Once I did the learning styles inventory, I had an, a few students who I found were extremely auditory. I also had them do a couple other learning styles inventories of, um, around their reading ability. Um, just a reading interest inventory to find out did they enjoy reading and um, just to find out a little bit more about them. And what I found was my students who were auditory did not do well with the kind of feedback that I was providing. And if I just gave them that same feedback but then recorded my voice, um, it, ch it completely changed what they were doing. And they all of a sudden started resubmitting their work. Um, our English language learner students, this is also something to think about. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So really, um, you may not think that learning styles make a difference, but they do. I know that you can't always change your feedback every time. And it's important for students to learn to adjust to different kinds of feedback. Because in life, they're going to get different kinds. But we want to help our students learn. So knowing their learning style can make a big difference. Within Blackboard um, Learning Management System Learn, there, is a number of, there are a number of tools that can help students um, when we're thinking about their learning style. So we can add in things like pictures. We can add in videos, which are going to help both our visual and auditory students. We can add in audio clips, photos. And we can even give students things to do. For our kinesthetic learners, sometimes we don't think about that, getting them up and away from the computer to go do something and then report back on it. Perhaps they, instead of writing um, their response, they can create a video or a website or go outside and do something, um, interview someone. So those kinds of kinesthetic opportunities are really important for our students as well. So not just in feedback, but in what we're creating, thinking about um, offering students choices in what they're creating for us. So segueing into learning styles, we started talking a little bit about reading ability. One of the things that's very difficult to tell if you're completely virtual um, and you don't have any face-to-face -face contact with a student is their reading ability. Some of those cues that we get in the classroom um, students who are putting their head down during reading time or um, just those visual cues that we're not getting, uh, we may not know that our students um, are struggling readers. And certainly students' reading ability can really impact their understanding. That's a big duh, right? So if they're in a pure um, purely virtual setting, we want to find out as much as we can about their reading ability. We can do that by just asking pointed questions um, to learn about our students. We can ask them, um, do they like to read? Are they good readers? We don't have to judge them, but we can just find out as much information as possible. If you're in a, a blended setting, um, we can look at our test scores. We can uh, listen to students read out loud. We can get to know our students and find out more about their reading. And if we know that they're a struggling reader, then we can provide some, some opportunities for feedback with audios and videos to really help them understand what they're doing wrong and telling them what we want them to do. It's, it's un, we'll never get them to move forward um, if they don't understand what they're doing wrong. And we're only providing that feedback um, in a way that they can't get it, which would be reading. Have any of you had this experience with students? where you're not sure if they're struggling readers or not. Um, and sometimes we assume that students just aren't doing the work. And we think, oh, 
they're just lazy, perhaps, but really they don't understand. So we don't want to um, make assumptions. We want to find out as much as we can about our kids. One of the things that really changed the way I thought about teaching um, was when I was an online teacher and we had the ability for students to resubmit their work. When I was um, a face-to-face -face brick and mortar teacher, I did allow my students to resubmit. We did a lot of test corrections. Um, because I was an English teacher, I always would allow my students to rewrite their essays um, as many times as they wanted if they wanted to improve their reading or their writing ability. You can imagine not a ton of students took advantage of that. But giving tests, um, especially exams online, really allows students to resubmit their work, um, especially if you're using test banks or if you're offering feedback on an assignment um, and you're telling students what they did wrong and they can turn it in again. Students seem to be much more likely to return in their work in this digital environment. I think also it provides a certain amount of uh, anonymity, being anonymous, students can return in their work and not everyone knows that um, what their grade was or that they have to fix it. Sometimes when students get poor grades and you're handing back tests in a classroom, everybody's curious about how everyone else did. And a student who did really poorly might be embarrassed, so they might um, give the old, oh, who cares, you know, blah, you have to be cool kind of thing. Um, and when a teacher offers the opportunity for corrections or do it again, they may not take advantage of that because they want to seem cool or um, they don't want students to know that they did poorly in the beginning. We have to remember um, that we want students to be successful. We want them to learn. So if they did poorly the first time, that means they didn't get it. We, there's an old adage, if, you, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And we want students to take advantage of that. We think about mastery learning. Mastery means that you keep trying until you get to a certain level, and resubmissions allow you to do that. We want students to have those multiple chances to learn. Um, we want to encourage them to be successful and let them know that failure isn't an option. You can keep trying, and I'll be here for you to help. Um, this decreases fear for students, and it increases motivation and self-esteem. So if I, um, I think about my son, who is, has struggled with, in math for just about as long as I can imagine. Um, he's really missing some, some key, um, maybe standards or pieces, uh, key concepts that he never got. Um, and he is not motivated. He doesn't have a lot of self-esteem. When it comes to math, he disengages. So really, he needs a teacher who is going to allow him to resubmit, who encourage, encourages his successes, and shows him that he can be successful at this, that perhaps there are just certain things that he doesn't understand, and if he focuses on them, he will improve overall. Um, I'm very passionate about resubmissions. Um, my, my son's teachers at his brick and mortar school don't really like that about me, because I don't understand if the student um, doesn't get it, why they don't get a chance to keep trying and keep working until they do get it. One of the cool things about using a learning management system is that it's really easy to give the opportunity to resubmit student work. Um, here is an example of uh, the inline grading tool within Blackboard. And it allows you to fully annotate the student's work. So you can see within the page, I've been able to highlight, to draw on the page, to cross things out, and to give that feedback right there for the students so when they open the document, they can see what kind of work they need to do. I can also give him personalized feedback inside the LMS, where you see the big orange arrow. Um, and I've told him to please resubmit with corrections and to look at the edited version. So even though he's gotten a B on this, he can do better. He can improve. He doesn't have to but he can. So there's lots of options and, and opportunities within an LMS. It's almost it's actually easier in the digital environment to offer that um, ability to resubmit. Additionally, um, learning management systems often will allow you to, to choose the number of attempts. So here in Learn, you can set a single attempt. You could set one attempt, two attempts, or you can set unlimited attempts for students to continuously go back and try again. Any questions or comments about resubmissions? 
Okay, we have just a couple more slides before we wrap up. Um, one, and these really focus um, more on the teacher themselves than on the student, but what we do as teachers obviously really impacts our kids. And one of those things is turnaround time when we're grading work. Um, I can remember being a brick and mortar teacher and carrying papers home with me every single night, which most of us do. Um, and then just taking them back to school with me and <laughs> not grading them and not doing anything with them. And those papers travel with me back and forth sometimes for a number of days. The problem with waiting a long time to give feedback to students is that they've already moved on, that they don't um, necessarily remember what they even worked on. The best time to, to grade work is as soon as possible the students turn it in. Now I know that we're all only human and we have a lot of things to do, but giving that feedback as soon as possible will allow students to still be in that mindset of what they just turned in. It also um, helps them if you are going to allow them to resubmit that work so that they remember what they were working on. It's still fresh in their mind. Um, consider perhaps um, two two-day turnaround is helpful. Um, a good friend of mine um, once said, think about grading yesterday's work today. One of the problems with working in a digital environment um, for teachers sometimes is that that digital um, place where students turn in their work is never empty. And I struggled very much with always having work in there. I didn't struggle with it when I was carrying it back and forth in my, in my school bag, but when I had it digitally and I could see the number of things that I had to grade, I seemed to want to continuously grade, 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 and I was never done, and that was not good for me. So if you think about grading yesterday's work today, I take all, I can sort, that's another benefit of using a learning management system, I can sort all the assignments by, when, by date, when students turn them in. I can grade everything that was from yesterday back, and then I can be done. And then my students are getting, um, they understand when I'm going to be grading their work. They don't ask me as soon as I turned it in, did you grade it yet, did you grade it yet? <laughs> because they know that they'll be getting, um, They'll be getting some of their work um, very soon. Thank you guys for your for your um, contributions. Forty eight hours uh, turnaround time is is it's a great goal to set. And you know you can't always make that goal. We're only human. So the other key thing is to let students know if you are going to take more than your normal time, whatever time you've has you've set. You need to let students know that I'm going to try to grade your papers within this amount of time. And if you know you're not going to because you've gotten sick or it's a vacation or whatever, you just, let, you just need to let your kids know that. Hey, um, this is what's going on, and um, I'll be getting your papers back a little bit later, but don't worry, um, you know, you'll be getting them. And that makes you more human for your students as well. And they tend to interact with you much better when they know, when they get to know you. Time management, we were sort of alluding to that as well. So um, using your time wisely when you have all of that information digitally, like I said, sometimes it's easy to constantly be in the system and not um, take time for yourself. So when you think about grading work and providing feedback, do that during your slow times or when your students aren't around. If you're lucky enough to have your students with you in a blended environment, then that's when you want to be interacting with them and, and being their coach and their guide and their facilitator and grade when they're away. Also chunk your time. If you're going to set aside a certain amount of time for grading, um, turn off your email, um, turn off your phone, and, and, and that goes for anything actually. Just really focusing on that one thing will allow you to be much more successful. There are tools within learning management systems that can allow you with that, or can help you with that time management. So certainly calendars, um, the needs grading view, where you can sort um, by what you're grading or by the user or by the date, that helps you be much more efficient. So if you know that you're going to be talking to a student's parent, you can grade all of their work. Or again, if you want to grade yesterday's work today, you can sort by the date. Um, it's also helpful to grade all of the same kind of assignment together at once. Um, you'll get, you kind of get in that mindset of this is the one thing that I'm grading, so I'm grading them all together, and you can go a lot faster. 
In Blackboard Learn, we also have something called the Retention Center. So I can see the students whose grades um, are low or maybe who aren't doing so well, and I can focus on some of those students. It helps me make sure that I'm getting to the students who really need me. So to wrap up, we've talked about some of the differences between um, giving feedback in an online world and a brick and mortar world. Certainly a lot of these strategies and ideas I think overlap. I think good teachers do um, have good strategies regardless of the environment they're in. So a lot of this overlaps. So thinking about what makes us a good teacher um, in the brick and mortar setting is a lot of times the same thing, but there are some key differences. Like we talked about like tone and not being able to see those students and making sure we're specific and telling them where they can get help, et cetera. We've explored different ideas such as resubmissions. We talked about mastery learning and learning styles and how important those things can be. And we want to remember that we want to give students feedback that's specific, personal, engage, engaging, and timely. Because in the end, what we're really thinking about is how can we help our students? How can we get them to learn more um, and really have that love for learning that we want them to have throughout their lives? So I'm going to stop there and see if anyone has questions or comments or things they might want to add before I turn it back over to Katie. I see a couple of people typing, so I'll give you guys just a few minutes. Sure, Mark, no problem. It's good to see you, by the way. Thanks, Lisa. Well, I will be here. Um, I'll hang around for the next couple of minutes. If you have more questions, please feel free to reach out. And Katie, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thanks so much, Claudine. This was a great session. I really appreciate it. Um, you did a great job. So keep, keep the questions coming in the chat, everyone. Um, as we wrap up here, just a reminder, if you haven't done so already, um, download the free VBK12 Live app. This session, all the sessions from the series will be published within the app. And um, please join us on Monday uh, for a session with Jenny Day from North Carolina Virtual School. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Thank you so much, Claudine, for a great session. Thank you. It was lots of fun. I appreciate you guys taking the time to stop by.